move on to the Jaden Rashada saga because it got a huge closing of the book uh, over the weekend. Jaden Rashada is an Arizona State Sun Devil. So if you haven't been following the story, Garrett's going to kind of roll through the timeline here in just a second. But it's been all over the place, man. He's committed to Miami, then commits to uh, Florida. We have the NIL fallout where he was, you know, promised $13 million and didn't get that $13 million and got out of his national letter of intent. And now he becomes a guy that I think could possibly be a day one starter um, in the Pac-12 for Arizona State. So Garrett, take us through this timeline first and foremost, and then what does this mean for the parties involved, specifically Arizona State and Florida? Yeah, so... Just looking at the timeline, and we're going to stay zoomed out because there's so many specific details that we could go so into. It. We, we could almost do you know, 20. <laughs> we could do 20 or 30 minutes on this if we wanted to, but uh, we have uh, more pressing issues to get to as well. Um, but basically, middle of the summer, he makes his original decision to commit to Miami. He commits to Miami over Florida, over Texas A&M. I think Bama had an offer out there. Um, and that, he was one of the guys that you were looking at saying, okay, he's a. I think he was an Elite 11 guy. And so he was, you know, widely considered one of the better quarterbacks there. Um, And, and, you know, you want to get a guy like that. So he commits to Miami, you know, done and dusted, we're fine. And that's how it stayed through most of the fall. But, of course, Miami has maybe a little bit of a worse season than we expected in year one. And, you know, not that Florida was necessarily, you know, beating the brakes off of teams, but uh, maybe not as embarrassing as some of the stuff that Miami went through this last year. And in the early November period, uh, Rashada decides to flip to Florida. Now, what we learned afterwards is there was a deal promised through the Gator Collective that was also going to pull money from other sources for $13 million to get him to commit. And that's basically how we got that to happen the first time around. Um, so that's that, that's kind of how he ended up committing to Florida. Now, that deal fell apart in December. Apparently, whoever was leading that collective, they sent sort of a notice saying, like, we're not going to be able to fulfill 13 million uh maybe they were out over their skis a little bit there um and and they just said you know what deal is going to fall apart but that didn't end up coming out or none of that news came out until january when he doesn't show up to uh the the early move-in day for florida right he was even a few days before that at the all-star games of the the senior bowl stuff not senior bowl whatever they call it the under armor game and all those yeah yeah, he was there, and he's taking pictures of Florida commits um, and saying, like, yeah, I've already started to learn the playbook, looking over formations. and we're Saying doing... all the right things. I would yeah, say. it sounds yeah. great. If I'm a Florida fan, I feel fantastic. We got our quarterback of the future. I'm thrilled, right? From there, you have to go and say, okay, well, what happens next? He gets released from his NLI after some drama and all this news about the collective and the $13 million starts coming out. He gets his release, and then – through the end of January, he takes one unofficial visit to TCU and then signs with the Sun Devils. And so, you know, for me, I'm looking at this and saying this couldn't have been more than just some conversations over a phone. Plus, probably if this is the way that it went, probably some collectives and some money involved and, and getting a deal straight to say, yeah, this is where we're going, which I'm not upset about. And I want to be clear. I think. Jane Rashada is the kind of guy who is going to have drama follow him. And I think that's a little unfair. I do think he's going to get a lot of bad press and there's going to be a lot of, you know, home fan bases that want to trash on him for his money and whatever else. If you're a talented athlete and they're offering you money, go take your money, right? That's yeah. if somebody put 13 million in front of me, I would switch schools like that, right? There's almost no issue with doing that kind of a switch for me. So I don't want to trash on the kid. I don't want this to be a thing that we continue to to rag on him about. To talk about where his career is going, I think he is a day one starter at Arizona State. I think he is absolutely going to be the guy to come in there and kickstart Kenny Dillingham's uh, stint with Arizona State, however long that goes. And that's a massive boost because they've gotten some big guys in the portal. They've gotten some, you know, some some more splash plays. And, and considering where this program was maybe 12 months ago, the fact that you get a top quarterback to commit to your school out of high school, plus a bunch of guys in the transfer portal, I think you have to be thrilled if you're Arizona State. This is a bad look for Florida, though, right? I mean, (laughs) this is just a rough look for Florida to not be able to come up with the money, to not be able to, you know, get that money together from your Gator Collective. Now you've got Graham Mertz, 
solid quarterback, but definitely not anything to you know get massively excited about based on what he's shown on the field. Um, so you have a quarterback, but you, you're probably looking at this as a massive opportunity wasted. And, and that's kind of where, you know, I don't know if this belongs in the recruiting segment, Trey, but this maybe is a little bit more of a transition. Does this kind of stop the collectives race and maybe, or maybe not stop, but maybe put a pause to it and say, hey, if we're not going to be able to deliver on massive promises and if you're going to start to see some of these collectives fall through, is this going to maybe make the offers more realistic, maybe make universities more hesitant to extend an offer based on the collective? I mean, what are you thinking on on the NIL approach going forward? I keep hoping that NIL is going to police itself, um, and I keep being disappointed in that hope. So, yeah. <laughs> look, I, I would hope that this would be a tale of caution for these collectives, but the people that are in charge of these collectives are in those positions because – they're bold and they're a little bit reckless and they have a huge desire to see their program succeed. So I I don't know, like these people that we're talking about, most of them are really great businessmen, but I just am not sure that they are thinking rationally because they're not really thinking. It seems like from a business perspective, they're thinking more like sports fans. And that's what we know about sports fans is they do not think rationally. And they're kind of just doing whatever it takes to make their team have a leg up. So right. initially I was hoping that these collectives, this structure would be kind of run more from a business standpoint. Like, is this a good investment? Is it a good idea to give a 18 year old kid $13 million? And I think most people thinking from a business perspective would say, absolutely not. That's a terrible idea. Even if they're the best, you know, pass all the background checks you want, like look like the best slam dunk athlete in the world they're still 18 years old. And I don't think that offering $13 million to an 18 year old is a good idea, but it seems like we're not thinking like business people or investors. We're thinking like sports fans. And that's, that's going to be really interesting. Now I love what you said about Rashada. He's going to take a lot of heat Mm -hmm. throughout his career at Arizona state. If he decides to transfer, he's going to take even more heat, even though a thousand guys are going to transfer. Right. Decides to transfer. If he does, it's not him that should take the heat. It is a hundred percent the grown men that offered yeah. him the $13 million and then could not back up that deal. Yep. If that's what actually happened and it looks like it is, they're the guys that should take the heat. The heat should be directed to Florida. I absolutely agree with you. If I'm 18 years old and I'm offered $13 million, dude, I don't care if you're telling me I have to go play in, you know, another country. Yep. I, I can go play in the CFL for all I care. Yeah. Like sign me up for that when I'm 18 years old. I do not blame him one bit and every single person that's going to be making fun of him for that would have done the exact same thing as him. So no, absolutely. If you're considering making fun of Jaden Rashada, maybe redirect that to some folks down in Gainesville that should have some more heat on them. For yeah. That. Well, and my biggest hope for this is that this does kind of slow down what's happening with the collectives. I think collectives are great. I think the players should get paid for what they're worth, right? I think that they should be. And if you can come up with a lot of money because you've got a big donor base or whatever else, great, do it. I have no issue with that. I don't think this has to be some equal thing with a salary cap and everything else. Like if you can get guys their money for the fact that you're selling out stadiums and bringing in lots of cash and whatever, like, great, do that. I have no issue with that. What I'm hoping though, is that these crazy numbers that mostly have been made up, not, not in every case, not in this case, but in a lot of cases, the the accusations, we could think back to last year with A&M and their $30 million class, which was thrown out by some, you know, random message poster on a, on a board slice bread. Like, we can go back and talk about all of that, right? But a lot of these numbers being made up, I think, hurts the long run because it, and we talked about this a lot last summer, it just kind of hurts the players' abilities to know what's really out there and to have a good, accurate idea of what they can expect coming out and getting into college. So, you know, I think that this will probably start to slow it down now that we see some of these inflated figures start to default or, you know, not follow through or whatever it is. And and I think once you start to see that, it'll start to regulate itself. It's not going to happen soon, but I think as these collectives start to lose some credibility, it'll reflect better for the players maybe that have been there a little bit longer and they'll know what to expect so they can kind of set the expectations there. Gracious, yeah. 